<laughs> Alright, this one won't be as long as my Dead Island review because it's more of an expansion than an entirely new game. And also, I've had enough of Dead Island after playing Dead Island. But I have to cover Riptide before I get to Dying Light. It's like eating your Brussels sprouts before dessert, except it's reviewing video games. That's not saying that Riptide is a bad game. It's much better than the first, but the glaring problems from the first carry over. So let's start with the bad and then we'll go on to the good. I went into this in the original Dead Island review, but I'm covering it again anyway. The movement is sluggish in a really strange way. I don't think people realise how sluggish it feels just by watching. It's like sickening to play. Every input has a certain delay to it, like you're playing a third person game from a first person perspective. You don't just start moving, you slowly speed up, and if you change directions you come to a stop and then start moving again. It's, it's weird to move like a real person in a video game. It even made me feel woozy at times. And I play VR and don't get woozy. So I, I don't know what's up with this. <laughs> even with the FPS being in the hundreds, it feels slow, unresponsive, and just not smooth. It drags everything in the game down. Your movement and combat, your dodging, everything. Your swings, they lag behind inputs. The amount of screen shake is disorientating, and enemies sometimes ignore impacts of weapons and continue attacking. Like, not even flinch, they just nothing. No response at all. Again, I'll get to it when I get to Dead Island 2, but my god, why do they call that unresponsive when this game feels like this? Seriously, people, if you think Dead Island 2's combat is unresponsive, go back and play the first two games, Dead Island and Dead Island Riptide. You'll be surprised at how poorly it's aged. Just what in the weapon goes through them. Sometimes they respond, but most of the time not really. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, on to something good. A new feature of the game is Siege Defense. This isn't like a horde mode or anything, this happens in the campaign. These are sections where you have to defend your camp from a horde of zombies. Very simple. However, you can take side missions to upgrade the camp and get things like improved fences, which are electrified minigun turrets and better weapons for the survivors themselves. Oh, that's the other thing, the playable survivors are here in the camp rather than just only appearing in cutscenes like the first game. If they're not under control of a player character, they'll show up in the camp just chilling. Usually there's a mini-boss zombie at the end of these siege events, which is nice, I guess. You'll also be setting up traps using mines, etc, as well as throwables. I used them a whole lot more than I did the first game. It's probably one of the better additions to the game. Fingers crossed it makes a return in Dead Island 2 with the rumoured Neighbourhood Watch expansion. This is an edit to my script. Uh, it's been confirmed to come out October 22nd this year. It's a great highlight of the game and I'm glad it's integrated into the main story. You have reasons with your side missions that will directly impact your ability to continue through the campaign and its difficulty. There are some quality of life changes that make the game a bit more bearable compared to its predecessor. For one, some of the skills have been reworked to be a bit more useful, and upon starting a new game you get to invest a ton of skills straight away, because this is more of an expansion, so you're continuing on from the first game. And the beginning of the game is much more straight to the point, you get guns within the first hour and are fighting enemies other than walkers, infected, and thugs within the first two. You'll often just stumble upon enemies that you saw from the first game in areas that make sense to them, like the floaters just chilling in water. There are still cutscene introductions for enemies, but that's reserved for the new ones. Zombies even now appear in a logbook with information on them, along with named special zombies that appear in certain locations, sort of like dungeon bosses. You can also gain weapon proficiency levels now as you use one type of weapon more and more. This helps some characters more than others, but even for characters like Sam B, whose entire skill tree goes into blunt weapons, it helps make sharp weapons and guns more viable, if that's what you happen to have on hand. The first two of the new enemies aren't all that interesting. First you have your frenzied walkers. They're just like regular walkers, except I think they attack faster, and they like to get stuck in the environment. 
like the few times they've shown up for me they've gotten stuck in the walls and at best couldn't attack me and at worst would block my progress because I couldn't attack them. I don't think I have a clip of this which is disappointing. Frenzied Infected. So you remember in the last game the boss infected that were the size of thugs that could knock you over like thugs in the first game but were just named zombies? Yeah they're called Frenzy Infected now. Despite them being identical to those mini-boss enemies from the first game, they were treated like normal infected. They're nowhere near as spongy as the final boss of the last game, but that's not saying much. It's also weird that they're thrown at you so often at a point in the game where all the other new enemies have been introduced, but they don't make any new appearances. And around the last siege, it's just frenzied walkers and frenzied infected, and I don't know why. It was never a mystery that the first game was scuffed, but Riptide feels rushed. Like, these were placeholders and they were going to add some special enemies here instead, but they didn't have time, so they made the enemies already there all strong and added Frenzy to their name. Alright, now to the actual new enemies. Starting with the Grenadiers. Grenadiers are infected people in hazmat suits with flesh coming out of their side. They grab this flesh and throw it towards the player, hence the name. They are introduced in the lab section along with some hazmat zombie reskins, which no, they don't get their section, they're just regular zombies without their teeth. The Grenadiers have a much higher range than the floaters, making them closer to living mortars. Like the floater, however, they're not great at close range. Wrestlers are thugs on steroids. They're slow, but hit like a truck. Unlike thugs, they are much more durable and have a very big arm. This arm gives them a huge amount of range and acts as the hammer for their attacks. Not much more to say on them really. They're introduced when a friendly survivor mutates into one for a one on like 20 other zombies fight because everyone else is busy standing around. But yeah, they're pretty straightforward and hurt. Screamer does what it says on the tin. It screams, stunning you and alerting and raging other infected. They are introduced pretty late into the game and are a pain in the ass, because they stop you from fighting back because you have to cover your ears. Shooting them from range or throwing objects is recommended. If you can't be prepared to run around in circles for it to stop screaming, or try and kill it really quickly. Browners are also a bit like infected, but they're a bit different. They'll be floating on top of water when you're boating around, They'll remain dormant unless you get too close or are on the boat. They're not very different from the standard infected, but the one special ability they have is a boat attack they can do, which involves a brilliant quick time event that sends them flying into the stratosphere. Other than that, they're identical to infected. As mentioned earlier, there are named boss zombies like the first game, except they're a variety of different things rather than just thugs and infected thugs, or frenzy thugs as they're called in this. They also have a backstory in the book, which I don't think I've said until now, it's called Kessler's Log. They often have an interesting, quite funny backstory. For instance, Ogre here got a bite to learn the demon's plan from the inside. Yeah, this guy was an idiot, and possibly a narcissist, given they thought only they could save the world. Quick Death here wanted to expose the experiments that were going on on this island, but he had no evidence. So he went and got some. He found some very, very spongy evidence. Now onto the story of the game. It starts right where the first Dead Island ended. You land on a ship in a helicopter. Charon is arrested. You are handcuffed and this Tony Stark looking fella named Serpo wants to experiment with you. Average day in the life of people who are immune and gain super mutant powers from it. Oh and there's a new character as in another immune which I have neglected to mention until now because I didn't bother to play as them. The name is John Morgan, they're a military man, previous member of the ADF which makes him a hand-to-hand -hand character, strangely. Like, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think the main skill you get out of the ADF is Krav Maga. I mean, there's no way he's a worse shot than Perna, right? Maybe she was a really trigger-happy police officer? I don't know. Anyway, John's all about knucklebuster-type weapons and is a nice addition to the character roster. So anyway, Charon and the Infected Girl, whose name I forgot, are whisked away by Tony Serpo. And of course the infected girl bites one of the guards. This ends about as well as you think it does. 
The ship is quickly filled with infected, as sadly the ADF are not trained to deal with something with two legs, but they've only trained against eight-legged beasts. So anyway, during the chaos you get out, get a gun, and the ship promptly sinks with you waking up on the shore of a new dead island. Because there wasn't enough. You are saved by Harlow, the only new character whose name I can remember. This starts Act 1. Not much happens here, you're mainly trying to find a boat. There is an impressive tunnel network as well, which, according to this missionary, can help you escape. Now, he is a little crazy, and um, thinks he can kill the world by burning us, essentially. He's going to cook us alive. With your help, we will conquer the evil that has infected Palanite. You are the key that can save humankind. Villa, get a fucking grip, man. Put that down. Don't you now. see? You and you are the cure for this pestilence. And if you will not step forward and sacrifice yourself for the good of all, then you shall suffer a trial by fire. We must feast on your flesh to ensure the future of the human race. This ends as well for him as you might think it would. With your guy dead, you need a new way to navigate the tunnels. Enter Dr. Kessler, who given his age and German accent and slight connection with modern inhumane experience may suggest a certain past life. He's also the writer of the in-game zombie guidebook, so best to keep him alive for now. But you know, he gave us a map and we promptly discover that these tunnels were flooded. Luckily, we have a water pump on hand. Turn this damn thing off. And that didn't work, because it's noisy. It's so noisy, in fact, that we need to grab mini guns to defend the position, because so many zombies are attracted by the sound of a water pump that only two mini guns serve to protect us. Making our way through the tunnels, there's some waste dump down there, and Wayne is bitten. You remember Wayne, right? No? Neither did I. But now he's grown five feet and is going to make us remember him because of how spongy he is. We put him down, promptly look for a new place to set up on the island. And there's these closed docks controlled by some prisoners. I'm sure they're nice folk. We have plenty of great experience with prisoners. Hey, y'all don't have no problem with me coming Everyone through here, right? Food, no, we don't care. As long as you pay us what we want, you can do whatever the fuck you want. What you want? Everything you're carrying. Money, weapons, ammo, supplies, all of it. Now hand it over. I ain't really somebody you want to fuck with. Fine. We'll just kill you and then take your shit. Makes no difference to me. Kill them! They are not nice folk and neither are we. We also get an in-game explanation for Fury, which is pretty nice. Wasn't asking for it, but I'll take it, Dr. Kessler. I went berserk, man! Just calm down. There's no reason to get hysterical. Well, it sounds like the virus has mutated, but it appears to be very minor. I don't think you're in any real danger, but you definitely want to limit your exposure to any additional mutagens. Yeah, you think? What happens if I freak out again? The fury of feeling. That is the result of the mutation. It amplifies the release of large quantities of corticosteroids from the adrenal cortex. Will not progress if you can avoid exposure to the mutagen again. But continual exposure can cause further, even more dangerous mutations, turning you into something, uh, something quite horrifying. With that, our new goal is to escape by the ferry, which naturally makes a lot of noise. Not as much as the screamer, though. This is where it shows up. I also don't have any footage of us making it across on the ferry. I think there was a cutscene. But I'm not playing half the game again to check, so take my word. Please, I've been through too much. Anyway, our friend Marvin thinks the theatre would be a good place to set up shop with Joaquin, I think that's how you say it, who is French. Did I mention Marvin before? No? That is because he doesn't matter and neither does the French lady. Alright, if you care, the next little bit is spoilers, so you can go away until this timestamp or whatever it is, all right? Lovely, not missing much. So we clear out the zombie-filled theater and oh, yay, the French lady is alive. And she's aggressively French, like she's got the hat on and everything. This can't possibly stand. We're gonna burn all of your precious film reel. 
technically doing it to attract a helicopter that Serpo is sending over, but I don't care. I'm doing it to take revenge for something the Bretonians did to me in Total War Warhammer 3. So anyway, the Gosh Down Smoke attracts an entire frenzied horde. This is the last siege event that I was talking about. But we have an RPG, so it's all fine. Serpo arrives in his helicopter and he wants to take the immune first. Naturally, this means once the immune are on the helicopter, he leaves everyone else behind, and we can't have that because... Morality. This fact doesn't go over well with the surviving colonel. Did I not mention him? That's because he doesn't matter! I have my orders! Speaking of things that do not matter, Harlow is now missing. They have been ever since we made it to the theatre. Lucky. Our next step is to try and scavenge from the helicopter, and from that we discover that Serpo is alive and has a way to get off the island. My script said isn't. I wished my script was right for a second, but no script, you're wrong. See, Harlow herself is also immune and is heading towards a boat to get off the island, so we just need to go kill her and then escape. This somehow involves an exploding bulldozer. I will not elaborate further. Anyway, the second bullet spongy final boss ensues, except this one has a gun. You end up injecting yourself with some zombie virus buff juice, and she naturally gets pissed in response. And every other zombie in the building. The amount of enemies you fight here is dumb. Once they're out of the way, you stun lock Harla to death. Then you find the boat and leave Serpa behind. You back here, you fucking freaks! Because, of course you're going to leave him behind. Look at the fella. It's also teased at the ending that your immunity may have ended and you might have turned. But there's a sequel now, so we know that's not the case. Except that also happens in the sequel. So that is the case, maybe? But not here. My question now is this, what the fuck happened to Charon? He was set up with this mastermind villain in the last DLC, and nope, he's whisked away, nothing. Nothing from the first game ties it to this, other than the helicopter landing there. All the characters that mattered are gone from that. You only have the Slayers left, and they just sort of whisk around and kill things. They don't have a huge impact on the story. Like, I was setting up my last reviews to say, oh, what is Charon planning? Nothing. Nothing. He doesn't matter. None of this matters. Conclusion. This game hurt my heart and soul, but was also better in gameplay than the original. I am quite torn. If you like the first one, you'll like this. But like the first one, it felt like an utter slog towards the end. If you have a few friends to play with, it might be better, I'm not sure. Tune in next time for Turtles. Wise men say, you can't rush perfection. Um, it's a microwave dweeb. You, my son. I told you, perfection. I'm an artiste. The Michelangelo of pizza. I'm... Wait a minute. Okay, guys, time to go. We've got bad guys to hunt. But I... You can have more pizza later, Mike. More? Father? Wise man say, you snooze.